Welcome to Inspire You. Your mind really matters. Brought to you by Be Well Indiana. I'm Jules from Radio Now 100.9. You can catch me every weekday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And you can also hear me when you download the Radio Now app. Today, I want to take a moment to talk about mental health. I know a lot of us are struggling right now because uh, 20. 2020 has been so rough. Uh, today I'm joined by Angela Levingston, who is a clinical social worker for various Indianapolis hospitals. How are you doing, Angela? I'm doing wonderful. I'm excited to be able to talk about this, this topic. I have been providing mental health consults for over 25 years, and it's something I'm really passionate about. Yes, as am I. Um, I think that we don't talk about it enough. So I'm hoping that somebody watching today, uh, it helps them out or it helps their friend or family members out. I want to talk about stress, depression, the holidays, because I know that we're all feeling the stress of the holidays right now. Also, I want to talk about self-care and also pandemic fatigue, which that's kind of where I want to start because 2020 has been such a roller coaster. This pandemic is new for all of us. We're going through it together for the first time. Uh, so is pandemic fatigue real? I read that was a thing. Yes, the one thing that you did say that is our advantage through this is it's a shared experience with lots of people that are going through some of the similar experiences that we're having all at once. And what's made it really difficult, I believe, is that it started off with, we think that it's going to be a sprint mm -hmm. and it out to be more like a marathon. And so at this point, our minds and our bodies not really prepared to be able to go that distance. So we get exhausted. And so one of the things with pandemic, uh, uh, pandemic fatigue is you start to kind of lax a little bit on what the safety protocols uh, should be like wearing your mask, washing your hands and doing your social distancing. And it's very important that we stay strong, that we do that to protect ourselves. Yes, definitely. Is this kind of like, obviously this is the first pandemic for us. So is this something pandemic fatigue that is diagnosable? Not, not really. But what it can do is it can exacerbate uh, symptoms of already diagnosis uh, disorders like mm -hmm. depression and anxiety in particular. And it does have the potential to onset some of those conditions that could be diagnosable. So how do we know if we're dealing with pandemic fatigue? Like, how do I differentiate what I'm feeling uh, if I'm just feeling tired or is it just I'm fatigued from everything that's going on? Well, the, the biggest things you're looking at is where that fatigue and that irritability and some of those symptoms are coming from. Because if it's coming primarily from that one source related to the pandemic, then that's where you need to focus in. If it's coming from outside areas, then it could be related to other things that's going on. Something that you just said kind of struck me is irritability. And I feel like that that's something that we're all kind of feeling. We're all on edge. What what else could we be feeling with pandemic fatigue? Well, some of you could be feeling some of the sadness. Uh, some of it you could be kind of feeling uh, just kind of overall feeling muscle tension. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of different symptoms and people are going to experience it in different ways. Definitely. So how can we cope with pandemic fatigue? The biggest thing I'm going to stress is that you really, really, really need to follow those safety measures. They're very important. Make sure you do continue to wear your mask. Make sure you continue to do the social distancing. Make sure you continue to wash your hands. And then sometimes you have to not only social distance from some people, but you have to emotionally distance from people, particularly because people have different views about what this virus is and what it isn't. And when people are constantly trying to be dismissive or calling a hoax, and for people that know the seriousness of it, it can be exhausting to listen to those conversations. So I would recommend that you take some time just to have an agreement not to discuss those things because it gets people kind of keyed up. 
That's huge because like, I think some of that even might help to stay off of social media. I see a lot of people just posting things on social media and it does, it really, it really gets me fired up sometimes. So I think even avoiding social media as well as avoiding some of those people having conversations that you don't want to be a part of could also help. Absolutely. Uh, so the next topic I want to hit on is stress. Oh my goodness. I know I'm not the only one that has felt the stress of 2020. Uh, a lot of people might have gotten let go of their jobs. A lot of people might be picking up even more than they had. They might be dealing with e-learning and their kids at home sharing an office uh, at the kitchen table with their kids right beside you learning. What does stress look like in general for us? Ooh, that's a big one. Stress is a big <laughs> thing to recognize is with stress, it's really those stressors and how your body responds to those stressors. It has some of the same symptoms we talked about with that uh, pandemic uh, fatigue that you just feel exhausted, you feel irritable, you feel anxious. Um, and it kind of throws everything off balance. The irritability is another one that's a big key in that. And just really, really knowing who you are, that you can actually recognize those signs early will give you the best opportunity for the best outcome. But I will also say that even when we have challenging times and we have stressors, they do always present with an opportunity for growth and change. And we need to be mindful of that. Yes, definitely. How can we identify what is causing us stress? And are there hidden stressors that maybe something I'm doing every single day stresses me out, but I really have no idea how to pinpoint what that is? The, those are big ones. And one of the things that you touched on earlier is social media. Uh, yes. Is a big one. The news, negative news is a big one. And sometimes our friends can be with high drama, our constant complaining. And even within ourselves, sometimes we don't even recognize that, man, I've just spent about 10 hours complaining about the same thing over and over and over again. So those are some things that uh, we need to be mindful of. And the biggest clue you're going to have is how your body responds to it. Mm. And what are some of those warning signs? I know that sometimes for me, my eye starts twitching a little bit if I get a little too stressed out. And uh, are there these warning signs that our body is giving us that says, you need to slow down, you need to just chill out and stop? Yeah, one of the biggest is sleep. When it starts to impact your sleep, that's probably one of the biggest warning signs. And particularly, you don't want to go more than three days with them paired sleep. You need to start kind of figuring out what's going on here, kind of searching through your kind of daily activities, your moves and trying to pinpoint what's causing that. I know early on when the uh, pandemic was first um, um, hitting Indiana, I could not figure out why at nighttime I just couldn't sleep. I was keyed up. I thought I was doing extremely well with anxiety. My mind felt that way, but my body was telling me otherwise. I just couldn't sleep. And so once I recognized what was happening, I changed my patterns of behavior and I started with trying to exercise. Once I started doing that, then I started to notice my sleep start to improve. So the first thing is start to recognize when something's off, your body's usually trying to tell you. Sometimes, you know, you wouldn't recognize it um, earlier than that. But if you know that you're having no struggles, pay attention. So I know you said exercise is a good way to kind of help you uh, fall asleep faster, maybe uh, get a, get rid of some of that stress. If I'm like laying in bed, having trouble sleeping, this has actually been me the past few nights. Is there like an exercise I can do or something I should be doing before bed every night to kind of get me into that mode? Yep. Primarily just kind of following through with what you're noticing the pattern throughout the day. Because sometimes it's the things that you're doing throughout the day that's going to impact your functioning at nighttime with your sleep. Also listen to understanding what is it that's actually interfering with your sleep. For a lot of people, it can be that those racing thoughts that just keep playing over and over in your head. Mm -hmm. And then doing those techniques for a lot of people is just kind of writing those thoughts down on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. um, 
in the trash can and sitting aside to kind of signify to your body that you're going to deal with those issues later. They're not going to disrupt your, your sleep in that moment. So those are some techniques that people have done. Other people, um, essential oils has been really helpful. Um, yes. Oil has been really good for a lot of people. Just being able to kind of uh, take in that aroma helps kind of relax, relax the body and the mind. Um, you can get really creative with being able to try to find the things, listening to uh, white noise and um, comforting music can help prepare your body to get ready to uh, prepare for sleep that night. One thing that I kind of have gotten in the habit of lately, and I think that it's negatively affecting my sleep, is laying in bed and scrolling through my phone. That's a bad idea, right? Yeah, it can definitely impact your sleep. If you're not, your body's not prepared to kind of shut everything off and uh, closing those blinds and curtains and having that uh, dark area that you can sleep in, those are all things that are critical. All right, so obviously a lack of sleep can impact your health negatively. Uh, what about stress in general? Is How can that have a negative impact on my physical health other than my mental health? That That's a big one. Because stress, when you look at it at its most basic element, it was protect us from physical danger. So mm -hmm. body recognized that, okay, I'm in danger. I have to decide how I'm going to defend myself. All these hormones are taking place and these neurotransmitter things are all firing up to take care of it to keep you safe. The problem is, and it's appropriate to do it then, the problem is when you're not really in that state of danger, that type of physical danger, and everything is kind of out tilter, your body's really good at being able to try to balance itself. And when it gets thrown off like that, it's not in the best equipped ability to be able to do the, those healing things. It starts mm -hmm. to stress your immune system. Uh, it starts to impact your cardiovascular system. I'm saying you have high blood pressure, heart problems. It impacts all the, the GI systems. You start to have upset stomachs. Um, it can wreak havoc if you do not recognize it and start to feel like, get an understanding of how to manage that stress. And this is going to kind of lead into my my next question. Can stress over time, can you develop anxiety and is it permanent and is it controllable? Anxiety is probably one of the most common mental health disorders. It is also one of the most treatable mental health disorders. Uh, for a lot of people, just being able to get in with a therapist, talking on a regular basis, can help resolve those symptoms. For some people, medication has been most beneficial and you can do a combination of both. So yes, it's definitely treatable. Um, it doesn't have to be a long-term condition. You can get the techniques and the medications can help you be able to combat those symptoms. So how can we cope with stress? What's the best way to do that? There are a lot of things. I usually kind of start with the three A's and it's probably going to be more comprehensive about the entire subject that we're talking about. And those are the affirmation techniques. Those are the routine things that we should be doing on a real, on a regular basis to be able to cope with any type of stressors we're, we're facing. Number one is sleep. Um, when I do my crisis consults, that's probably the number one complaint with people not getting really quality sleep. Number two is exercise. You really, really need to exercise on a regular basis. The third, make sure you're eating well, well-balanced meals. Um, and there's other things after that that kind of fall in place that we've already talked about. Limit your time on social media. And please, please, please um, avoid drug usage as a way to cope. Limit your alcohol usage. Um, connecting spiritually. Um, connecting also with your families and friends in a positive manner. Those are all the things that we should be doing on a regular basis. Now, the other things that we can do in the midst of um, um, stressful events is doing those adaptive skills. Those are things that we can do right in the moment to help us manage the stress there, meaning doing little things that take breaks out of your day, like doing a little exercise, dance breaks, doing those types mm -hmm. of things. Um, even doing some meditation, if you got a few minutes to doing that, 
uh, 10 to 15 minutes in the morning just to kind of do some reflection time. This is a time that can get really, really creative and you can really personalize it. And then there's those things that we should be working to strive through those aspirational goals that we set, maybe to improve our old, over physical health or um, one day be able to get back to planning vacations or working yes. on write a book or doing journal writing or I want to learn how to swim or learn a new dance step or new language. Those are all the things that we can do to work through improving our overall mental health. I love that. I really, really love that you said take a little dance break. Uh, I think that that could really, you know, just five minutes, listen to your favorite song. I need to start doing that a little bit more often myself. Uh, I want to move into depression. I know that this is a really heavy time of the year for a lot of us. Uh, it, it It's happy for most of us. And then for others, it's just not. And what does mm -hmm. depression look like? Well, yeah, depression is really going to be how it's impacting your functioning. It can impact your, your moods, your behaviors, and in particular, those, those feelings of sadness. Uh, for a lot of people, it's hopelessness, it's helplessness. It's those irritability symptoms that we talked about before, uh, impact on sleep. And, and with depression, it can go either way, you're not sleeping enough or you're, you're sleeping too much. Uh, and the biggest thing with depression that puts most people at risk is the suicide ideation. Mm -hmm. How do I know if I'm depressed? If I've never felt depressed, but rather than I'm just feeling sad today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things where you're looking at, first we will start off, I usually like starting off asking people, what does, what are you experiencing? What does it feel like? I like for them to describe that first. And people get really, really creative in describing what it feels like for them. For example, people say, "Can I feel like I'm in this dark hole? I, I feel like I just kind of lost sense of direction. I don't feel like I'm able to really enjoy myself anymore. And then, you know, once they say that, then we go through some list of those symptoms and you have you experienced these, do you feel like it's difficult for you to be able to do those day-to-day -day functioning things or you're able to do those basic things like getting up, taking a shower, or doing the things you need to do to work? Or does it feel like, you either skip doing those things or it takes a lot of effort for you to do those. So you're really, really looking at how much it's really impacting your function. So how many days in a row should like, if I'm just laying in bed in the morning, like I can't get out of bed, I don't want to do anything today. How many days in a row is it like normal? Is that okay to, before you start to really worry and think, am I depressed? General rule, and this is not for this is not the case for everybody. One day, probably not a big deal. Two days, you may start thinking, okay, something may be a little off. After three days, it would be concerning, and it, at that point, you need to start kind of addressing what what's going on and assessing whether it's appropriate for you to come in and and, and get some some help dealing with some of the symptoms and the behaviors. Can depression be an an ongoing everyday thing or can it just be a uh, situational like I just got let go of my job and I don't really know what to do next or I just got out of a relationship it can it just be a, a phase yeah absolutely you can be depressed to, uh, in relation to situations that's happening in your life um, and you can deal the tool you can gain those tools to help you kind of cope with that when you start moving into the stars like major depressions and that's when it gets more long term that's where we're really kind of assessing how severe that function is having on your day-to-day -day functioning where you feel like you're not able to meet your your own basic needs you're not able to meet your kids basic needs you don't feel like you can do um the things you need to get done for work that's where you're looking in, into major depression but situational depression absolutely um and a lot of times we looked at that as more like an adjustment disorder that you need kind of time to adjust to what events are occurring in your life. So what should we do if we are feeling depressed? 
And you said, I didn't hear you. You said, what should we do if we are? Yeah. What should we do if we're feeling depressed? If you're feeling depressed, well, look at trying to do those strategies to try to, to offset the, those symptoms. Um, for a lot of people, the longer we sit with some of those negative dark thoughts, the more difficult it is for us to kind of come out of those moods. And so when you notice that you're starting to feel those things, if it's happening on a daily basis, do things to, to try to distract yourself from those negative thoughts. And it can be, you know, as we talked about doing the dance break, it can be the crossword puzzles. It can really be creative, uh, sitting around blowing bubbles or doing meditation or prayer. For some people really connecting nature here lately, a lot of people have been kind of rediscovering that. Um, people would got involved in the summertime with bird watching, um, uh, looking into the sky and just kind of seeing things that are much bigger than you, connecting spiritually. And for a lot of people, connecting with their friends and just being able to have that share experience and vent, because sometimes we just don't realize that we're not the only one having this experience. And when we can talk to someone like, oh my gosh, you too, yes, I've been going through the same thing and this is how I've been dealing with it. And always as a therapist, I think all of us could benefit from uh, seeing a therapist. It gives you an opportunity to really connect one-on-one -on -one with someone and um, takes away from that um, emotional connection that you have with your friends that you feel kind of responsible. I can't share everything with them because they mm -hmm. may feel their way. So there are a lot of things that we can do to help us get through when we're having um, uh, depressive episodes. And I think that a lot of us feel like that there is this stigma about going to therapy. Like, oh, if I go to therapy, then I'm admitting there's something wrong with me or what will people think if they find out? And I think we really need to normalize that you're, there's nothing wrong with you if you go to, to therapy. It is completely normal and talking to somebody really can make all the difference. Absolutely. I hope and I think one day we're going to get there that we get into the habit of doing mental health checkups, uh, just like we do when we go to the dentist or the eye doctor or get our, our physical checkups and make it uh, something as a, our normal routine for our overall well-being. Because a lot of times, with physical health conditions and mental health conditions, it is so hard to separate what's causing what. Uh, the other thing is people coming in seeking mental health treatment are some of the most courageous people that I have ever met because mm -hmm. it takes courage to first to recognize that something's not quite right and then to do something about it. And I will venture that the average person just off the street would not have would have difficulty understanding uh, the courage that it takes. I mean, even just talking about it, you know, our body gets kind of revved up because that our most courageous people are the people who come in and seek mental health treatment because they recognize uh, how difficult that is, but they're willing to have that hint of hope that things can get better. Definitely. And at what point should we be seeking professional help? Anytime, absolutely, that you're starting to have suicidal thoughts. Um, if they're passive thoughts or you're starting to say, well, you know, I, I just want to go to sleep. I don't want to wake up. Those types of things are if they get to the point that they're more active thoughts where you're thinking about ways to hurt yourself. Absolutely, you should, you should come in for therapy. Again, if it's impacting your functioning and you can't do those day-to-day -day functionings, either they're really impaired or they're a struggle, for you, you should definitely seek at least starting with uh, a professional uh, assessment and then moving on from there about the treatment recommendations. And can you give us some suicide prevention information? Yeah, you, you, as far as like the, the warning signs or you're wanting uh, so, some, some warning signs and a, a phone number that we can call and some resources. Yes. So the warning signs is a lot of those symptoms associate with depression where you're starting to feel really helpless. You're starting to feel really hopeless. You're starting to turn uh, to substances. Uh, you're, you're isolating yourself from other people. 
And then, of course, the suicidal thoughts that you're having, those are the warning signs. Um, we have a lot of talk lines here locally. Um, we have um, 317-621-5701. That is the crisis line. That's through Community Hospital. Uh, there's national suicide crisis lines as well. Um, also encourage people to have those phone numbers in their phones so that if they need emergency services, they're readily available. And something that I think is interesting that uh, I, I've had discussion on suicide prevention uh, with others, something I think is interesting is that we think that those phone numbers are only for somebody dealing with suicidal thoughts, uh, but actually I could call if, if my friend is in need, if I'm really worried about my friend to learn how to help them through this, correct? Like I can use that as a resource. Absolutely. And then the, suicide, the National Suicide Prevention Number, the 1-800-273-8255, 1-800-273-8255. Uh, is one that gives people the opportunity to really kind of talk through what they're experiencing. The great thing about that line that I really like is that if it gets beyond their ability to help, they'll connect to places like um, uh, mental health hospitals. Um, and then from there, they will connect. If I happen to get that call, they're connected to me. And then we'll take over from them, advising them if they need to come in for emergency evaluation. It's great information. Um, let's move on to some holiday season issues. Now, this is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year, but as you know, uh, it, it can be very difficult for a lot of people. And I feel like everything that we just covered between pandemic fatigue, stress, and depression, they always tend to elevate at this time of year, right? Absolutely. So how can we deal with the stress of the holidays? The biggest thing I think we need to start off for each and every one of us, at least the adults, is have some self-compassion. Yes. Uh, and just recognize that this year it's going to look a little different. But even in the midst of that, that we can still find joy and meaning. And sometimes we're going to have to get into the most basic elements of those uh, and get really creative, you know, so we're not going to be, for some of us, not going to be able to be with family members. So being able to try to do those creative things to make it meaningful. Um, one of the things when I was working at one of the schools is um, the children got together and created these little um, um, heating pack things. And they tied just yet different type of materials. They put rice in it. And that, that gift that they gave to me is probably about 15 years old. And just about every member of my family comes where I said, where's that rice pack, heating pack? <laughs> creative doing gifts like that maybe to um just encouraging older family members that we're not going to be able to tell their story about christmas was like when they were younger and tell stories about uh when it was a struggling time for them doing those types of creative things you as my as a creative as you can get you can really get without having to spend a whole lot of money uh, maybe you can put on a show or performance and send it out to family members that you're not going to be able to be with or you can write love letters to family members. You can do those types of things to make it really, really uh, special. And not forgetting it's a religious holiday is to be able to connect spiritually, uh, maybe trying to figure out uh, what Bible verse that you want to try to live the next year in, trying to uh, utilize those principles. And the, the biggest thing too is coping, not only with during the holidays, is letting your values kind of guide you on how you want to cope with struggles. Once you kind of understand what your principles are, what your beliefs are, that you move toward those goals. If you find yourself moving further away from that, not being the person that um, you want to be, uh, you can self-correct and start to say, you know, this is not me. I'm not the person who's screaming and yelling and doing that type of thing and being mean to people and change in direction to be more in line with your values are. Yes, and is there a kind of a way that we can plan ahead to avoid some of this stress? Maybe it's 
I don't think that I want to talk to this family member just because kind of what we talked about with pandemic fatigue. Yeah, I mean, as far as just trying to figure out what's going to be best for you to be able to connect. So finding that common ground with family members, knowing that, you know, I, I can have a great conversation with you about this particular topic. And so bond that way. But if you know it's going to set you off or they're going to talk about subjects that it's going to bother you, you know, the big things over the last few years was certainly going through with the, the election and politics and mm -hmm going on that family members are learning ways to uh, to be able to calmly have those relationships without getting in those heated discussions yes that's a big one um so a lot of families uh have lost loved ones this year whether that's due to COVID 19 whether that's just for some other reason how can we help our friends and other family members cope with the loss that they felt this year. Yeah, that that's a big one. And I would, I mean, my heart, my thoughts, and my prayers go out to all the family members that have lost loved ones. There is no doubt. I wish we would um, have um, been more acknowledging about that throughout the course of this pandemic. Um, even you know, I lost a cousin who was Olympic athlete to COVID. So just being able to honor that memory and recognize that pain is real. My heart goes out to you. Uh, I feel that pain, I sense that pain. And doing some of those creative things to, to help you grieve with the loss. And so how can we take control of this holiday season? So the holiday season does not control us because I feel like sometimes that we get so caught up in, oh my gosh, I got to buy the perfect gift or I got to do this. I got to make this whole meal and it has to be exactly this. And I know that a lot of us aren't getting to do our favorite family traditions this year due to the pandemic. So how can we kind of just take control and and just let the holidays not control us? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is setting some expectations and just saying, you know what, this is what we're going to try to do and try to stick with it and be surprised in the moment of how special that can be when you have to make some adjustments. Cause then you can kind of find um, the beauty in some of the, the simple things that we normally just let pass by and we don't take notice uh, from. So I think that's going to be a big piece in that and not feeling so much pressure that you got to keep up with your your sister is doing what you're doing, or your brother's doing, or other friends or families are doing it, but making it unique and special to you and your situation. I will give example at Thanksgiving. Not only for Thanksgiving, we have huge family celebrations. We either have them here in Indianapolis or we go off to Virginia or we go off to Atlanta. And so going into that holiday, I was kind of like, mm. and I was, let's just make the best out of it. And I have to say, it was probably one of the best I have. It's just the four of us my husband, my two kids, we had a wonderful meal and it, it felt nice to the point that I would like to in the future have that in the rotation saying, okay, every so often we're going to have a smaller celebration where it's just the small immediate family so we can really enjoy each other because sometimes that gets missed when we're, there's a whole bunch of people and we're running here and there and we're kind of missing those moments. Definitely. I kind of had the same experience this year for Thanksgiving. It was just me and my husband and we made a whole bunch of food for ourselves, had a whole lot of leftovers. And I was like, this is nice not having to run to five different places. So it was kind of a, a nice little change from the norm. So there might be some positives with maybe not doing some of those family traditions. We might build new family traditions out of all of this. Absolutely. And I think it also makes you appreciate those times that you did have. You're like, oh, we've got to do this again. And then you look back and you can look back and say, you know, I really appreciate those times. One of the things we do is a, a giving tree. And so we cut off with all the family members that's come through. The year. I think we started in 2011 and they come through the house and they're right on a cut off um, leaf about what they're thankful for. And just the four of us were able to look back and see all those people who've come through our house and what they said and had time to kind of reflect. Some of them were really funny. 
So we had time to kind of sit and laugh about that and appreciate those times. Remember when we did this or we did that. So just being able to live in the moment, being able to live in the present, don't put so much pressure on yourself during these holidays times. And, uh, and like I said, being able to appreciate those small things, uh, they make us so much more rewarding. And looking at, you know, that connection relation, taking those walks outside and doing those small things and, and appreciating all the gifts that, you know, is right in front of our eyes. Yes, definitely. And uh, you kind of talked about a little bit of self-care stuff at the end of that. So let's move into self-care. What exactly is self-care? Well, self-care can get fun <laughs> because it gives you an opportunity to really kind of promote those things to um, your overall well-being. And you can get really creative for doing that. I think the one of the biggest thing is, is having fun with yourself. Now, of course, you can do self-care with other people. But sometimes that can distract because you got to focus on, well, she doesn't like this type of food or she doesn't like that type of food or he doesn't like that. But really spend that time with yourself to do those things that you particularly enjoy. And it can be, it can run the gamut. It can be like, okay, I'm going to take an afternoon nap and I do that. That's what you do. Or I'm going to pick my favorite hot chocolate and just kind of take in all the senses and the more you can use all your senses in trying to enjoy something, the better off your experience will be. So doing those types of things, or I can do the other things. I, I'm just going to sit and relax and read an article or read a book or um, do a makeover. Um, for a lot of people, they find that fun to do those types of things. Um, um, get your favorite dessert or uh, work on an activity that you want to do. And I was thinking earlier when thinking about that, I remember, um, and I'm probably aging myself for just doing the the model cars, which you can build these model cars and just reconnecting with your childhood when you felt like there were endless possibilities. Yes, I actually really enjoy coloring. That is so fun. And I do feel like a little kid. I have yes. my Lisa Frank coloring book with like all the bright colored crayons. It's a lot of fun. My husband enjoys uh, building little Lego sets. It does take us back to our childhood, kind of lets us, our mind just disconnect from everything that's going on. Uh, it, it's just different for everyone, right? Like self-care doesn't look exactly the same to every single person, correct? Ab absolutely. And I know that we hit on earlier about uh, using drugs and alcohol as a way to cope and how that's unhealthy. Are there other unhealthy things uh, that we are doing to kind of that we think are self-care but aren't self-care? Yes, food's a big one. As mm -hmm. most can Yes, you can use food in ways it's not appropriate. Of course, sex is another one you can use in ways it's not uh, appropriate. Spending money is another way that you can use um, in ways it's, that's not appropriate. So yeah, just be, really be, and, I, and one of the biggest thing I learn is when I'm doing this, I learn from my patients, from my clients. And the thing is that most of us are all going through something uh, none of us is guaranteed a stress-free life. It just, it's not going to be, and it probably wouldn't be a life worth living if, you know, every day was a perfect day. The difference is that the people who are coping with it in a healthy way, in a ways, and people are coping with it in unhealthy ways. So just being mindful of that. It's trying to find those healthy ways to be able to deal uh, with those stressors and challenge yourself to do things you think are better, you know, or that you wouldn't think that you're capable of doing, like training for a 5K, maybe doing something like that, or like I said earlier, learn a new language or learn how to cook different styles of meals. And, and then you look back and you it reaffirms that you are resilient, you are strong, and you're going to be able to get through, the, through this. It may look a little different, may not be exactly the way you want it to be, um, but you're going to be able to come through this. Is going to therapy a way of self-care? Absolutely. Uh, right now, it's been challenging because it's been a high demand to get people into therapy, but absolutely. Uh, one of the advantages that you know you have as a therapist is that you know a lot of therapists. And when I recognize that I'm not in my best mental state, I reach out to them. 
Um, ideally, you know, I should probably also be getting my own therapist that I see on a regular basis. I would encourage anyone um, to reach out um, and get connected with therapy. It can do wonders as far as maintaining your overall mental health and helping you deal with those difficult times that you are experiencing. And one of the things I usually tell people is through the questions that you start to find the answers. And you're you're doing a lot of the work. The therapist is just there trying to guide and, and giving you the ability to kind of bounce back on what you're experiencing and giving you some direction. That's all wonderful. This has been a great conversation. I learned a lot. Thank you, Angela, for joining us today for Inspire You.